Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, the morning after. Governor Murphy gets an earful from mayors about their utility customers who are still without power as Jersey digs out from a massive nor'easter. Today is International Women's Day and faculty here at Rutgers University took it as an opportunity to present a new report that they say show the disparity gaps here on campus. Plus, a garden state industry grown by Japanese Americans freed from internment camps, but not free. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. The storm took a staggering toll. Late today, more than 190,000 customers were still without power. At the peak of the second nor'easter, more than 320,000 power outages were reported. This morning, JCP&L said 133,000 customers were in the dark on top of the 25,000 whose power hadn't been restored since the first storm. PSE&G had 85,000 outages. The same bands of heavy snow that brought down trees and tangled power lines rendered many local roads impassable and caused hundreds of car crashes. On virtually every major highway in the northern half of the state, wrecked tractor trailers on Route 78 stranded people in cars for up to 10 hours. Things got so bad on Route 280 that state police resorted to using snowmobiles as rescue vehicles. In all, troopers responded to 530 crashes and helped 1,017 motorists with spin-outs, flat tires, and breakdowns. The State Department of Transportation deployed plow teams and contracted loaders who worked throughout the night, but officials warn recovery might not be measured in hours, but in days. With another nor'easter on track to strike Monday, Governor Murphy's management skills and patience have been put to the test. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan is with him. There are too many homes too many without homes. power right now, homes, and it's right, driving right. us crazy. Yeah. And they're frustrated. I don't blame them. At an Andover deli this morning, Governor Murphy got an earful from exasperated utility customers in Sussex County, where back-to-back -back nor'easters have left thousands without power. Murphy promised they'd get priority status, but he shared their deep frustration with JCPNL, which has 17,000 customers who've been offline since last Friday's storm, and more than 110,000 out overall as of this afternoon. Local officials accuse the utility of being unprepared. We got to make sure that uh, more resources are here to begin with. 100 percent. Before, okay. before it happens. Before it happens. Yeah. And, and um, it's really maddening that that didn't happen. JCPNL did request mutual aid after the first storm. The governor toured one staging area today where 470 line crews have bunked since the weekend helping restore power. Workers from more than 30 outside companies arrived to assist JCPNL and Murphy thanked the linemen but at a news conference this afternoon said he'd spoken to the CEOs of all four utilities serving New Jersey. We made it very clear to them that job number one is to restore power, uh, but also uh, our frustration, our deep frustration, frankly, it, it turned from frustration to anger on my part, uh, at the uneven uh, preparedness and the uneven response, not just from the last storm last Friday, but even leading up to that. Uh, and in particular, I, ha I have to say JCPNL's apparent lack of readiness remains a major issue that must be and will be looked into further. Murphy directed the Board of Public Utilities to conduct a full investigation into utility responses to both storms. We're going to examine what went wrong and whether the improvements to protect and strengthen our grid devised post Sandy have been implemented. We will look to see if all prepared preparedness measures were taken before last Friday, knowing an event, a major event was coming. My gut tells me they weren't. And if they've not been, this is entirely inexcusable. The mutual aid assistance has to be something that we have to review and review carefully. I, I have very little patience, as the governor does, 
for a cruise being sent out of this state when in-state utilities need help. The BPU currently has no indication JCPNL had assets out of state during these recent storms. Officials also mentioned utilities may need to trim back trees more aggressively to reduce the number of outages during heavy snows and high winds. Mayors welcome the governor's attention, especially in Byram, where four to 500 utility customers remained without power earlier today. I mean, I think he heard what we had to say and certainly um, you know, I guess the proof will be in the pudding over the next couple of weeks. We'll see what we can do with the BPU and with JCPNL and bringing them, you know, bringing them to some responsibility. The president of the Board of Public Utilities says it can order utilities to follow certain procedures and protocols, and that may happen in the wake of these two storms. In West Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan and JTV News. President Trump's tariffs topped the state's business news. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, as promised, President Trump today imposed tariffs on steel and aluminum imported into the U.S. The president said tariffs would protect America's security and the jobs of American workers. Our factories were left to rot and to rust all over the place. Thriving communities turned into ghost towns. You guys know that, right? Not any longer. The workers who poured their souls into building this great nation were betrayed. But that betrayal is now over. But right now, there's not enough steel and aluminum produced in U.S. factories to meet current demand. So for now, companies in New Jersey and other states will have to essentially pay the tariff to get the raw materials they need for their products. And those higher costs are expected to be passed on to consumers. Anybody who's going to go out and buy a washing machine, a dryer, a refrigerator, car, uh, anybody who's building a new home right now, there is steel embedded in almost everything we, we consume. And all of those, the single biggest cost in making a dryer, for instance, is the steel. And so we're going to see significant increases in a whole variety of, of consumer durable goods that uh, will affect New Jersey taxpayers. According to the Independent Tax Foundation, tariffs will cost New Jersey $477 million. These tariffs take effect in 15 days. For now, they won't be imposed on Canada or Mexico, as the president is seeking to renegotiate a trade agreement with those countries. Canada is the largest exporter of steel to the U.S. Meantime, a published report says President Trump is threatening to veto a spending package if it includes any money for funding for the Gateway Commuter tunnel project. That's what multiple sources told Politico. It prompted a stern response from Assemblyman Daniel Benson, who chairs the Transportation Committee. He said President Trump knows New York City and he knows New Jersey. If he doesn't understand the importance of safe, reliable and modern public transportation in the region, then he doesn't understand anything. In other news, we still don't know when Amazon will decide on the location for its second headquarters, but we do know the company continues to expand here in New Jersey. Amazon is building another fulfillment center in the state, this time in West Deptford Township. No word on when that new center will open, but Amazon says it will create more than 1,000 jobs. Amazon already has eight fulfillment centers and two sorting centers in the Garden State, employing about 14,000 workers. Today, health insurance company Cigna announced it is acquiring the pharmacy benefits manager Express Scripts for $67 billion. That includes debt. This comes months after CVS Health bought Cigna's rival, Aetna. These deals are coming as the outcry grows over high prices for prescription drugs and other medical costs. Companies believe by getting larger, they'll have stronger negotiating power on controlling costs. On Wall Street, stocks closed higher. The Dow rose 90 four points. And those are our top business stories. In Trenton, the State Senate Judiciary Committee was considering for confirmation some of Governor Murphy's key cabinet nominees. Brianna Venozzi reports from the State House. 
Nearly two full months into the Murphy administration and most of the 21 cabinet positions remain unconfirmed. The process requires one-on-one -on -one interviews with Senate Judiciary Committee members, and that can be drawn out as short or as long as they'd like. Today, they met to consider three more nominees. Is there a priority order you look at? Well, I always like to get the Attorney General and the Secretary of State confirmed right away. Those are the first two because they're constitutional uh, commissioners. Uh, after that, then, uh, then it's really at my discretion. And his discretion called for a vote for the commissioner for the State Department of Labor, along with Dr. Sharif El Nahal as the commissioner of the Department of Health and Carol Johnson to lead the Department of Human Services. How do you intend to advance the notion that we are not hostile to business? So I know that we can overcome any barrier or any um, hostility that businesses might feel by having better workforce training for those workers, uh, better uh, grants for the employers who are going to train them. The process was relatively smooth. If confirmed by the full Senate, Health Commissioner Dr. Elnaha will be one of the youngest at 32 and the first Muslim American cabinet member in New Jersey history. But it was a statement sent out earlier in the week by the state GOP party and Senate Judiciary Committee member Chris in Corrado causing another surprise, angry over the governor's announcement to lower contributions to New Jersey's cash-strapped pension system and calling for the Senate to vote down Murphy's choice of Democratic Assemblywoman Liz Moyo as state treasurer. You, in fact, called for the Senate to reject her nomination. Yes, I, you know, I don't want to speak before we vote, but I have some concerns, and the response to that press release was very well received. Um, people feel the same way we do, that we should not be doing that at this time. I'm not going to comment on that since I'm not completely familiar with that call. Um, I'm going to vet that nominee just like any other. We'll have conversations with our members and we'll see how it goes. All three nominees passed unanimously today. They'll now go before the full Senate. The only other hiccup expected in this process is within the Department of Corrections, where that commissioner nominee is expected to face tough questions about a sex abuse scandal within the state's female prison system. At the State House, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. A Mercer County court decision that could have a major impact on affordable housing across the state. Judge Mary Jacobson ruling Princeton and West Windsor must meet fair housing needs totaling more than 150,000 units. The Mount Laurel Doctrine went unenforced for 16 years until a series of unanimous state Supreme Court decisions in 2015 jump-started the process by turning fair housing laws over to trial courts. Fair share is the issue women and people of color gathered to address this International Women's Day at Rutgers University, where the faculty and staff in these most diverse of states suffer from a diversity gap, Leah Mishkin reports. We're really inspired by the West Virginia uh, strike of teachers, largely women, right, who won. We're also inspired by the uh, women's marches. Associate Professor Deepa Kumar says now is the time to talk about gender and race equity at Rutgers University. Now is the time to talk about a report over a dozen faculty and graduate students have worked on for the last two years. A report that looks at hiring patterns, salary, promotion, and family leave policy at the state university over a 20-year span. At our biggest campus, which is New Brunswick, where I think 70 or 75 percent of our faculty are, there's a salary gap. Women earn less than men. The report also shows a disparity in the genders of distinguished professors at the university. 20 percent are female, 80 percent male. When it comes to department chairs, the report found 40 percent are female and 60 percent are male. But when you look at this panel, you'll notice a lot of the support for change is actually coming from male professors. It's not acceptable for Rutgers being the kind of diverse uh, university that it is. An associate professor of French told us she's been working here for 20 years. The atmosphere is wonderful, no? but are we really being equitable? The data shows this. According to the report in 1997, close to 5.4 percent of the African-American faculty were tenured or on a tenure track. By 2017, that number dropped to 4.2 percent. The numbers for Latino and Latina faculty also show little change over the same time period. The report says it's gone from 2.4 percent up to 3.9. Our student body is incredibly diverse, right? Our faculty body, not so much. In fact, we've gone backwards. 
We reached out to Rutgers University and they gave us this statement, which reads in part, quote, Diversity and inclusion are foundational elements of the university's strategic plan, and the president has provided incentives to academic units, including additional financial support for recruiting and retaining diverse faculty. Decisions about compensation for our unionized faculty do not consider gender, race, or ethnicity. Still, the chair of the Latino and Caribbean Studies Department at Rutgers told us the department would not exist today, nor would um, Africana Studies, um, without the kind of activism that students pursued. The collective voice of the faculty is so important in terms of bringing about real meaningful change and writing that into our contract so that it can't just be taken away. And, and where, how far are you willing to take this? Well, as far as our faculty are willing to go. The agreement between Rutgers and Professors Union expires June 30th. In New Brunswick, Leia Mishkin, NJTV News. A stroke of inspiration, perspiration, and memorization. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Folsom, where 43 students from five South Jersey counties will meet for the right to compete in the 91st Scripps National Spelling Bee. Spellers from Atlantic, Cape May, Cumberland, Gloucester, and Salem counties will convene at Folsom Elementary School Saturday for the South Jersey Regional Bee. The big nationally televised bee starts May 27th in Maryland. Scripps claims New Jersey has only produced one winner ever. 13-year-old Catherine Close of Spring Lake came in first back in 2006 after correctly spelling Erspraka, a language reconstructed from later languages. Next to Atlantic City and a stroke of literary genius, the public library is stocking free books in three barber shops, so the under 12s can use the time reading while awaiting a trim. The Fade to Books program was inspired by the New Jersey State Library's partnership with the Long Branch Public Library and the Bridge of Books Foundation. Once grants became available to implement the program in local libraries around the state, Atlantic City jumped at the chance. Not only can barbers encourage kids' reading skills, but the kids can take the books and finish reading them at home. Finally, Gloucester County and a stroke of luck for the guy who famously got drunk in West Virginia and took a $1,635 Uber ride all the way home to Jersey. The founder of the freehold-based food delivery firm Eat Clean Bro is footing his bill. Kenny Bachman had launched a GoFundMe page to raise money for the fair, but Jamie Giovanazzo says his company will pay the fair to thank Kenny Bachman for choosing not to drive while drunk. The GoFundMe money raised thus far will instead go to Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And that's the Garden State Express for Thursday, March 8th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Immigration reform has stalled in Congress as it has over two decades, regardless of which party's been in power. This nation built by immigrants has a contentious track record in dealing with immigrants. An exhibit curated at Rutgers illustrates how American citizens of Japanese ancestry were freed from World War II internment camps to work here without being free here. Michael Hill reports. This traveling Rutgers University exhibit traces the history of incarceration in America, and it includes the internment of 120,000 men, women, and children of Japanese descent at camps set up across the country. Most of those internees were born in the U.S. Internment is actually a very technical term that describes the detention of enemy aliens during right. a wartime, mm -hmm. and so as we've been discussing, that really doesn't apply to the majority of the individuals who are incarcerated because these are American citizens. As Nazi German and fascist Italian forces were shredding Europe, their ally Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. A date which will live in infamy. 
President Roosevelt's administration and military commanders feared they had a national security problem. They targeted and moved thousands of German and Italian nationals from the West Coast, but stopped short of moving more or interning all of them as hysteria on the West Coast was beginning to affect German and Italian morale in New York and Boston. A different path, though, for the Japanese in the U.S., including now 94-year-old Frank Ono of Bridgeton. Ono was born in California. His family owned boats and a fishing business there. But it all sank in government suspicion and seizure after Pearl Harbor. The so crews all taken in with the bayonet point. They got all taken into San Diego jail. Ono was 18. His government would shatter his innocence by using his draft notice to reclassify him. Enemy alien. What did you think of that? Did somebody call oh, you an alien? And then well, you know, you're hurt. One historian wrote, momentum belonged to the extremists in the government. Ten weeks after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 that would send Japanese citizens and immigrants to camps till the end of the war. Ono's father was sent off to work, but he and his mother and four siblings went to Manzanar internment camp in California. At all the camps, the government would challenge internees with written questionnaires as to whether they were loyal to the U.S. or Japan. That was a ridiculous thing ago. And I mean, I, I just uh, despised the way they wor worded all that in there. The film Resistance at Thule Lake documents the protests and what else happened to the 12,000 internees labeled disloyal for telling the government it was wrong for turning its back on American citizens. At Thule Lake, for the first time, American troops under orders tortured people. Others who passed the test could take advantage of this recruitment ad and help the federal government replace the southern New Jersey Seabrook Farms labor that had gone off to war. Ono's mother and siblings were released to come in 43, but he stayed at Manzanar till victory over Japan Day in August of 45. Why wouldn't they give you a release? You tell me. <laughs> they think I was a radical or something. <laughs> At Seabrook, Ono's family joined thousands of others of Japanese ancestry in farming, food processing, and the business's pioneering freezing of vegetables in one of the biggest farms in America and a major supplier to the military. His father... He worked in the plant because he was loading certain things. Ono's mother... She, she took care of the kids. Historians say the South Jersey relocation accommodated families. It had daycare. Families could stay together, cook and share meals. But they say Seabrook also had a share of propaganda showing smiling Japanese posing in front of brick buildings when in fact they lived in wooden barracks and were not free to leave. Seabrook also included mothers whose sons joined the military and died fighting for the freedoms denied their mothers. Nevertheless, Ono compared living at Seabrook to what he calls Manzanar concentration camp. Well, you didn't have the fence, you didn't have a machine gun pointing at you, okay? And you can go out and buy whatever you want over there. You have to go to line up and get in the mess hall, eat. That's it. And you had a bar bar. You can go out no place. These are pins that were made in camp. Beverly Carr runs the 24-year-old Seabrook Educational and Cultural Center, full of memorabilia and photos and the history of the 29 nationalities who worked at Seabrook over several decades, none more prominently and perhaps painfully as the Japanese. All countries make mistakes. We try to speak as if we tried, we try to tell the story as it's told to us by the people who lived it here in Seabrook. And these are people who don't hold grudges. Some 2,500 Japanese internees wound up coming to Seabrook during World War II to work the farming operation. But what would have happened to them if they had not come here? I think they would have stayed in camps until the end, which a lot of the, 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 the other, the majority of the Japanese Americans did. At the Rutgers States of Incarceration exhibit on display till Friday, organizers say New Jersey is an increasingly diverse state, and so is the university, where more than a quarter of the student body is of Asian ancestry. But when you go out and travel around the state and you look for historic sites or landmarks or monuments, you don't find, for the most part, places that are representative of this state's diverse history. And so the joke that public historians here always give is, right, you can find hundreds of homes where George Washington slept <laughs> for a night, right? The exhibit raises the specter of whether such history could repeat itself in America. 
one of the aims of an exhibit like this one uh, provides the Rutgers community an opportunity to interrogate past practices. It actually has already happened. Um, you know, if you look at the practices of indefinite detention that various Muslim immigrants faced after 9-11, if you look at the you know, history of the use of Guantanamo Bay and other so-called black sites, the various principles that are being cited to justify these practices are very much in line with the same principles that were cited during the history of Japanese American incarceration. Next up for the exhibit, Antioch College in Ohio. In New Brunswick, Michael Hill and JTV News. And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. In 1947, New Jersey Seabrook Farms housed an estimated 2,300 to 2,700 Japanese Americans. Amazon employs some 14,000 people in New Jersey. The average market rate for a two-bedroom apartment in New Jersey is $1,300 a month. And National Weather Service numbers show Montville is the snow total leader for this nor'easter with 26.8 inches. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, lottery losers get another shot at winning a million. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. See you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities.